John chapter number 4. So let's go back there to the first, the first verse there. John chapter 4 says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made it and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. See, there's re everything that Jesus did in his ministry, there's reasons for. And he started gaining a lot of attention here in Galilee. And in many times, you know, his hour's not yet come. He told that to, um, to his mother, Mary, in, in chapter 2, when she asked him to bring wine. You know, his, his, his hour's not yet come. There's many times where he's fleeing from one city to another because if he stays there too long, you know, the Pharisees were, were getting really angry with him and they were looking to arrest him. They were looking to kill him. And, you know, up to this point, John the Baptist had been the one that was getting all the attention. Right? He was out in the wilderness. He was baptizing people. And the Pharisees were coming unto him and saying, you know, you know, who are you? You know, are you Elias? Are you the Christ? You know, and he was saying, no, I'm not. But he was getting a lot of attention from them. He was, you know, he was making a lot of waves. He was getting people's attention. People were getting saved. People were getting baptized. He was doing a great ministry and great teaching. And he was a hard preacher as evidenced by the fact that he ended up later gets arrested and beheaded because of his preaching. Because he didn't hold back. Because he was willing to call out sin, even if it involves the ruler of the people. Even if it involves a governor or a king or whoever it may be, John wasn't afraid to preach that. And, um, you know, he was getting attention from the Pharisees. But then, see, when the Pharisees started here, because this is Jesus' um, right at the beginning of his ministry. This is when he's just getting started. So he's just starting to get some followers. He's just got his apostles following him. And he's just starting to preach and teach and people are starting to, you know, and heal and do miracles. So now he's saying that, you know, the, the Pharisees hear this, so he leaves because he's not, it's, it wasn't his time yet to, to have that um, at that time. But what I want to point out here in the first two verses is really interesting because it says that, um, when they, it says when the Pharisees heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, again, meaning he was gaining a lot more popularity and people were following him, it says, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. And, you know, it throws us in here in parentheses. I love looking at these verses that are just parenthetical, right? That, that, are, that are thrown in God's word. And um, why does it say this? Well, I think it's important to note, we never see anywhere in the Bible Jesus personally baptizing people. And I think one of the reasons for that is because God knew that there's going to be people around today that teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And this is, this is maybe a smaller piece of evidence, but it's a piece of evidence nonetheless that if you had to be baptized to be saved, and the Bible tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost, but Jesus isn't baptizing people, but just, I mean, his disciples are, but he's not doing anything. How could you really say that you need to be baptized to be saved? If Jesus' job was to seek and to save that which is lost, if his job is to get people saved, then why wasn't Jesus himself baptizing people? Because you don't need baptism to be saved. It's a lie. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, the Bible says Jesus made more disciples and baptized more than John, but he wasn't doing the baptizing. His disciples were doing it. And people were getting baptized, of course, because it's, it's, it's a commandment. It's something that it should be done. But it's not required for salvation. And I just, I just wanted to point that out here. Let's keep reading. In verse number four, it says, And he must needs go through Samaria. And... Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, I think it's, it's easy to forget when we read about Jesus, we read the Bible, because he does so much great work, and he's healing. I mean, you read, when you read the story about Jesus Christ, I mean, he's given great sermons, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing, he's doing all this great work. But here we get to see just a little bit of the part of the humanity of Christ. It's easy to forget that Jesus Christ was an actual human being like you or I. You know, because we focus so much on the fact that Jesus Christ is God, he's God in the flesh, he's God made man, he's perfect, he's sinless. We have a tendency, I think, to overlook the fact that, no, he really did go through this human existence like we go through it with the same feelings and weaknesses and, and 
You know, it says here that he was um, being wearied with his journey. You know, he wasn't just a, a man of steel that just never got, got tired. You know, it seems like it because you read him going and going and going and he's up all night and he's praying and then he's, he's, and he's walking far distances and then he's preaching and then he's, you know, he's doing all of this work. Don't forget that he felt it. Look, when we get tired, when we get wearied, don't give in. Don't give up. We see, look at Jesus, the example. And it's important that these little phrases are in here that tell us, hey, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, he sat down on the well. I mean, he needed to take a break. He was physically a human being. Yes, he was God the flesh, but he was completely a man as well. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Anything you're going through, it's not like it's new to you. And it's not like it's new to anyone else. Look, Jesus went through all the same types of things that we have to go through, which is great. And we can take comfort and solace in that, in knowing that he truly understands. He understands it even from our point of view in the sense that he became a man. You know, you could say, it would be easier to say, well, God doesn't quite understand because he's God and he's all powerful and all knowing. Well, no, he does understand because he put limitations upon himself when he became a human being when he became like unto us, when he went through the hard times, he felt physical pain. The, think about the pain he suffered on the cross, being whipped, being able to see his bones and his ribs, you know, getting beat up. It, it wasn't like he just didn't feel that stuff. When they, when they smash a crown of thorns on his head, they start beating him on the head. He felt all that. Jesus Christ went through a lot, but... but Thank God that he did and that we can approach him and we know that we can get compassion from him in the, in the trials and tribulations that we go through because he went through trials. He went through tribulations. He knows what it's like to be hated. He knows what it's like to be reviled. He knows what it's like to have people just constantly being down on you or to suffer pain, to be tired, to be weird. All of these things, he went through them. So when we go to him in prayer, remember that. He knows. Even if no one else in this world, if you feel like no one else in this world can quite understand what you're going through, Jesus Christ can know exactly what you're going through. And we ought to go to him with all of our needs and with all of our troubles. This is just, a, and this is just some, some small phrase here because we have a tendency to forget that. Now, again, he did a lot of great work. And we ought to look at Jesus Christ as that perfect example of, so when we do get weary, think, yeah, but think about what Jesus did. I could push myself a little bit more. You know, I'm tired, but what did Jesus do? When, you know, when, when you think about when he fed the multitude, he fed the 5,000, and he went up in a mountain to pray, and he sent his disciples off into a boat. Well, he went up in that mountain, he prayed. It doesn't say that anywhere that he, was, he went to sleep. Because what it actually says is later on, after he, his prayer in the mountain, after the multitude dispersed, he walked on that water when they were already in the middle of the lake. I mean, walking from a mountain, we, again, we think of things a little bit different because we're driving all over the place and we've got all these different tools that we can get around from, from point A to point B really fast. But if you think he's in a mountain and then next thing you know, he's walking and he's in the middle of a lake, he's done quite a bit of walking already and it's the middle of the night. He already preached. He already performed miracles and fed the 5,000. Then he prayed, and then he's walking. That's a lot of work. I mean, he, he had to, it doesn't tell us he was weary then, but he had to have been. I mean, he was a human being. He's staying up. He's doing all this stuff. And I can tell you from experience, and anyone who's, who's actually gone out preaching and gone soul winning, it is draining. It is something that you can't describe the feeling because it's a, it's a different type of, of physically draining than doing a full hard days of work. It's similar. When you go out and you're working and you're doing manual labor work, you get exhausted after eight to 10 hours a day of working, of doing that, right? I mean, you just physically, your, your muscles ache, you get sore, man, you can lay down on that bed and you fall right asleep. Well, preaching, preaching God's word and preaching and doing soul winning and all that, it's, it's very similar. 
very similar. It drains you to a, to a, in a different way. And it's, it's, again, it's hard to describe unless you actually do it. But Jesus Christ is preaching like every single day. And he's not only preaching, they're walking around and, you know, doing all this other work. So he had, he got a lot done in his time here. He didn't just say, oh, no, I'm just going to take a nap. I'll just go, I'll go preach another time. He made great use of the time that he had while he was on this earth. And he's someone that we need to look to because he was full. You could say, oh, yeah, but that was Jesus. Yeah, but he was a man. Okay, he is the, the, the ultimate goal of what, of what, you know, potentially you could say we can achieve. Now, he was perfect. Yes, he was God in the flesh. He was without sin. But he had the same constraints that we have, physically speaking. <laughs> Definitely. He was in a mortal body. Yet he was able to accomplish a lot. Just, just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when, we're, when, when, you know, something might keep you from, back from doing stuff and from doing service for God. I mean, whatever it may be. Now, look, I know that there are legitimate things that people have, you know, especially the older we get, when you've got ailments and that are just preventing you from doing some stuff. And that's not, I'm not like preaching against it. I'm just trying to motivate you to think about, well, if Jesus was weary, if Jesus was troubled, if Jesus, you know, went through all this stuff, I'm going to see what I can do to push myself. And that's what we need to do when, when we look to Jesus and we look at his example. And, and it's important to remember that he got weary too. You know, let's keep reading. Let's keep on going in John. Um, <clears throat> verse number seven says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, excuse me, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, this is real interesting. Um, this is, obviously is a story of the woman at the well, and, and Jesus gets her saved. But um, I, want, I want to kind of focus in on that last section of that verse. There. It says, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And this is, if you remember from the book of Acts, this was something that, that came up over and over again on how the Jews' mentality was towards, definitely towards Gentiles, they kind of view them as, as a subhuman or as lower, you know, just a lower class of people. But they also had this viewpoint with the Samaritans, as is evidenced here, saying, look, the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Now, um, we saw earlier, because he's going through Samaria after he left Galilee, he's saying, um, he says he must needs go through Samaria in verses 4 and 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his father. Now, if you understand, if you remember in the Old Testament, the kingdom of Israel was divided, right? You, you first had the king Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. Then you had David, right? And then you had Solomon. Those were the first three kings. During the reign of all three of those kings, the entire nation of Israel was united as one kingdom. But it wasn't until Rehoboam, Solomon's son, came into being. And because Solomon had committed all of his sins and got his heart turned away from serving the Lord, God was going to rend the kingdom. He was going to take the kingdom away from, from Solomon's son, from Rehoboam, and give it unto someone else, just like God did with Saul giving the kingdom unto David. He, but, but what he did, though, is he divided it because, because of David, you know, it was a man after God's own heart. And because God had respect unto David, he said he's not going to take it away completely. So he left a remnant. He left, basically, Judah was going to be what um, the one kingdom was going to be. It's the kingdom of Judah. And then the other kingdom was the kingdom of Israel. So that's when, you know, Rehoboam was the king of Judah. And then um, uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the king of Israel. And it, it became divided into two kingdoms. And um, you know, I want to get into that too much. But Samaria is part of that other kingdom of Israel that, um, that was separated. And if you remember, you read through the book of the Kings and the Chronicles, you'll see that, generally speaking, the kings were way more wicked in Israel than they were in Judah. Judah is where the temple was. 
and where, you know, where God's house was and where God was, where, you know, the, the, most of the prophets of God spent their time and, you know, it was coming out of that kingdom. And that's where the most righteous leaders were coming out of. They were coming from David's lineage. And, you know, right off the bat, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was worried about losing his kingdom. He was worried that people were going to go back to the house of David. So he set up the golden calves. He said, no, these are your gods. So right away, he starts off just, just you know, disobeying God. And he's referred to all throughout that Old Testament as, you know, when kings are compared to someone for being evil, they're saying, well, he wasn't quite as evil as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was. He was, he was like the person that was used as the bad example, as David was used as the good example, you know, when people were like, well, he was righteous and did that which was right in God's eyes, but not quite like David, his father, did. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the, was the negative example of the kings. And, you know, so he, right off the bat, right after the, the kingdoms got divided, he introduced false gods. Now, what they did was very similar. They worshipped similarly, right? They still performed sacrifices and kept feasts and all these other things, but they were worshipping false gods, right? It was, it was something that was, that was wrong. So this kind of steered them off into a path. He caused, the Bible, you know, charges Jeroboam the son of Nebat with causing the children of Israel to sin. Because he did that, because he made these graven images and said, no, these are your gods, you're going to worship here. You're not going to go into that other kingdom to worship God there. You're going to worship them here in our kingdom. And um, he, he kind of caused a chain effect of, of just sin and wickedness by getting people turned away from God that lasted for a long time. Now, that's just kind of the history. But um, one of the reasons why the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans is because, because the children of Israel were, were more wicked. They got God's judgment earlier. They got taken captive before the, people, before the, children of Ju uh, the kingdom of Judah did. The children of Israel were taken away captive you know, they were brought into other lands. They had heathen brought into their nation. And there was a lot of mingling of, of, of the people. They did not keep their, you know, their tribes or whatever pure from mixing with the heathen. And they were brought in and had all this intermingling. So a lot more so than, the, than in the kingdom of Judah. So that's why the Jews that were in Judea, right, is why they're called Jews, is... They didn't, they didn't have dealings with the Samaritans because they looked on them as a lower class person, just like they did with the Gentiles because they said, well, they were mixed with the Gentiles, so they're basically like a Gentile unto the Jews. All that just to explain where we're at in the story because it's important to understand that because we're going to get to this again real quickly with what Jesus says to her. And um, so Jesus is talking to her, and he's a Jew, obviously, and this woman saying, well, wait, why are you even talking to me? The Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans. So um, let's keep reading here. And it says in verse number 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Um, so we see here, it's real similar to what we saw with Jesus and Nicodemus. Because Jesus is telling her, look, if you knew who it was that's, that's telling you to get me a drink, you would have asked me for a drink because I have living water. You would have asked me if you would, have, if you would know. And if you remember with Nicodemus, Jesus was explaining being born again. And he, he didn't get it. He's thinking like physically, like, can I go the second time into my mother's womb and be born? Well, she's thinking the same exact thing. She's saying, wait, how are you going to give me some water? You know, this is a real deep well and I don't, you don't have a bucket. You don't have anything to get that water out with. So it, the living water just goes right over her head. She doesn't get it. But then Jesus explains it to her. He says, look. 
you know, whosoever drinketh of this water, they're going to thirst again. This is, you know, this is physical water. You drink of this well, you're going to be thirsty again. He says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So he's saying, look, I've got the water that can give you everlasting life. I've got salvation. And that's, what, and that's how easy salvation is, too. It's just as simple as taking a drink of water. It's not difficult. You don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. You don't have to keep the commandments. You put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are saved. You are saved forever. You have, you have that everlasting water. You have that water that you never thirst again. Look, you will never thirst again. If you come to Jesus, if you get that living water from Jesus Christ, you will never thirst. He doesn't say, well, you'll thirst again if you turn your back on him. As some people have, you think. No, he says, you will never thirst again. He doesn't put a condition on it. He says, look, you take of this water, you are never going to be thirsty. And you know what that tells me? You're never going to be going to hell because I know people in hell are mighty thirsty. As we see in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man asked for Lazarus to put just a the drop of water from his finger to put on his tongue. You better bet they're thirsty. And Jesus says, you'll never thirst again. That tells me, hey, you can never go to hell. Once you are saved, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are never going to be able to go to hell. The Bible says in Revelation 21.6, it says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Freely, without charge. You don't have to do anything for it. It's a free gift. Whosoever will... Let him come, is what the Bible says in, in, in Revelation 22. It's up to you if you want to receive that. But he, but he, you know, he tells this woman at the well that, um, that she can have everlasting life. And that all she has to do is ask him. Right? And that's all we have to do. We just have to ask. As you said, you would have asked me for a drink. Once we ask God to be saved, hey, we're saved forever. Look at verse 15. It says, the, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Uh, that, that always cracks me up when I read that because he's like, like, you perceive, huh? Like, <laughs> you perceive he's a prophet. He has told you, like, you've had five husbands and just, and just knew all this about her. She's like, I think you're a prophet, aren't you? <laughs> you think? <laughs> he has told you that you had, you had five husbands and the one you're living with now isn't your husband? Yeah, I think he's a prophet. Um, but she answers him and says, you know, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say, you know, you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now I want to stop here real quick. There's a lot to get into in this point. But I'm going to stop here with, with that salvation is of the Jews. And there's a lot of people that have a misunderstanding of this verse. And it, it really comes up with now, especially with all the Zionist stuff that's going on, with that film being made, you know, there's a lot of people who are saying, well, no, you know, being a Jew is important because the Bible even says salvation is of the Jews. And, and it's true, obviously. Jesus Christ said it. It's true. But we need to understand what he's talking about here. So first of all, it says salvation is of the Jews. It means of, obviously, means from. It comes from the Jews. So the salvation... Especially in the Old Testament, God revealed himself unto the Jews. That's who God chose. He, he chose because he wanted to reveal himself unto the world. He wanted to reveal himself unto everybody, but he chose how he was going to do that. So when he chose the people, he chose the Jews. And it says, um, I think we're going to turn there. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Romans chapter 3, and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 7. I want you to see both of these. Romans 3 and Deuteronomy 7. Because we're going to see exactly why it's important that it came of the Jews. God could have done things any way he wanted to, but he decided to pick a group of people and say, you know what, 
this is who I'm going to call by my name and I'm going to reveal myself unto them. But it's not like God shut off salvation from everybody. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, people can come and join themselves unto Israel. It doesn't matter where you are from. You can come and become a Jew. That was what was allowed. You could have strangers and foreigners and they could come in and they could become a Jew. Meaning that they believed on the Lord God. You remember, we went through the book of Ruth, right? Ruth was of Moab. Ruth joined herself unto the children of Israel and she was accepted and, and brought into the fold, basically became a Jew, right? And she's of the lineage of David and, uh, you know, and, and of, the, you know, of that whole kingly line. She's in there as an ancestor and she was of Moab, but she became a Jew. And that was something that was totally allowed and that's totally scriptural. But we're going to see here, you're in Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So he's saying this is the advantage. Because he just got done saying in chapter 2, he says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. He just got done explaining, look, God doesn't care about you being physically a Jew. That doesn't matter to him. He says that you're a Jew is one inwardly. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe God. Hey, you are a Jew. The same way that people could have physically joined themselves unto the Jews because they had faith in God. This is the way that God views it. He doesn't care who you descended from physically. Who are you descended from spiritually? That's why Jesus Christ said unto the Pharisees, the people who literally did descend from Abraham, he says, you are not of your, of your father. You know, Abraham is not your father. Now, were, were they, was Abraham physically their father? Yeah. But Jesus Christ said, you are not of Abraham. Abraham is not your father. And he called them children of the devil. Because that's, they didn't believe, they didn't do the works of Abraham. They didn't believe like faithful Abraham did. They were of their father, the devil. And that's how God views it. And that's how Jesus viewed it. But what Paul does here then is after saying that, look, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile outwardly. It's what's in your heart. Then he says, then he goes back to talking about physically. He talks about you know, the physical seed of Abraham in verse 3. Well, what advantage then does, does a Jew have, right? I mean, what, what, what is the advantage of being a Jew? And he said, there is an advantage. Here's the prophets because chiefly, the main reason is because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The oracles, that's what God revealing himself unto them. They were able to see what God had given unto them. That's what the advantage was. It's like the same advantage of you know, growing up in a Christian household where your mom and dad are already saved. Hey, that's a great advantage. You're going to hear a lot more about God and you're going to understand a lot more and hear about the Bible than you would if you grew up with someone who's not a believer. right? The children of the Jews had the advantage of God was directly speaking like to their nation. Now, the other nations might have been at a disadvantage, but it doesn't mean that they couldn't get saved. It doesn't mean that they couldn't come in and be a part of that either. But they had the advantage of God using those people as his prophets to speak his word unto and to, and to write everything down. So that's the advantage that they have, right? So when the Bible says that salvation is of the Jews, turn, if you would, to um, Deuteronomy 7. We're going to see where God chooses his people. In Deuteronomy 7, it explains God choosing his people. But when it says that salvation is of the Jews, that's why. It's because God has committed the oracles unto them and God used prophets of the Jews to preach his word. And that's all that means. It doesn't mean you have to be a Jew to be saved. Or it doesn't mean that everyone who's physically born of Abraham is saved. It just means that, hey, that's who God committed these oracles unto. I mean, he had to choose someone to do it through because he was using man to preach his word. So he had to choose somebody. And we're going to see in Deuteronomy 7 why he chose them. Look at verse number 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. The Bible says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. That means they're separated, they're sanctified. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, 
because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. He's saying, look, God didn't choose you because you were some great, mighty nation. That's not why he chose you. Actually, you are the fewest of all people. And if you, if you remember anything from the Bible, God likes to show his strength in weakness. God likes to take the weak and beggarly elements of this world and make them strong. He likes to take the people who are abased and the people that are humble and lift them up. He likes to take the little things and make them big and make them strong because he gets so much more glory and honor out of that out of taking someone who doesn't have very many skills, who you, know, you would look at and you know, the society might look down upon them. Hey, that's the person that God wants to use because God can lift that person up and he gets that much more honor and glory because it's not based on the, that person's individual skill. Right? God says that, that he can save by many or by few. And that's why God loved it when Jonathan had that heart to go up and fight when, without the whole army. And Jonathan understood that. He said, look, God could say by many or few, he knew, he knew that. And he had that faith and said, let's just see if God's going to bring a great victory. So him and his armor bearer just went up and they just started slaughtering the, you know, the enemy and just brought this great victory because God saw that and he liked that. And he, he could use and demonstrate his power. Just like with David and Goliath, they was a smaller guy. He wasn't a warrior. Goliath is a huge warrior. Hey, God used David. It's not because David had some great strength and because David was this you know, mighty warrior that made him kill Goliath. It wasn't with his physical strength. God killed Goliath. God was with him, but God used David to do it because it was against all odds. Anyone that were going to look at that battle would be like, no way is David going to win this battle. But it's because the Lord fought for him and God gets all that honor and praise because of it. So we see here, and I keep on reading, verse number seven says, look, you were the fewest of all people. So God chose, first of all, he chose the Jews. He chose them. They were the fewest of all people on the earth. They were not large in number. He says, okay, I'm going to pick this people to be my people. Verse number eight says, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God made a promise. He made a promise unto Abraham. You remember Abraham was called the friend of God. It started with that one man being the friend of God, being a righteous, godly man. He believed in God and God chose him and in turn made promises for his descendants and said, okay, well, that's why God chose these people. And that's why he delivered them out of Egypt and everything else. Because, hey, he made promises to Abraham. So he was going to keep that promises. It says, um, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And remember, these are the books of Moses in Deuteronomy. We're reading the book of Moses, right? This is the law being handed out, and he's explaining why they were chosen. It's because of Abraham. But we're also going to see here, because some people like to think that, that the promises made to Abraham were unconditional, and that that's one of the reasons why we should be supporting that physical nation that calls themselves Israel today that was created by the United Nations because they think that God's covenant was without stipulation and that it is just forever regardless of anything that happens, which is not true. And we're going to see that right here. Well, let's keep reading because he says, God, he keeps covenant and mercy with, with them that love him and keep his commandments. First of all, that's what it says in verse number nine. That's who he keeps covenant with, with those that love him and keep his commandments. Now, did the children of Israel always love God and always keep his commandments? No, of course not. Let's keep reading. Though. Look at verse number 11. It says, thou shalt therefore, so because of this reason, because God is going to repay him to his face and not be slack to him that hate them, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Verse number 12 is key. Wherefore, it shall come to pass if, that word if is big. That's a conditional statement. Just like, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Talking about being baptized. If. You can't be baptized unless you believe. If. Verse number 12. If ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them. 
that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. It's not an everlasting, it would be an everlasting covenant if, if they kept the law, if they obeyed, if they did their end of the deal, then God would, would give them the everlasting mercy and promises and all these other things. They didn't. They fell short of that. That's why they even went into captivity to begin with. And all throughout history, when they do what's right, when they seek God, God brings them back. He brings them back into their land. You know, he, He'll bring them promises back in. And then when they forsake Him, when they turn to other gods, when they turn to idols, when they turn away from serving Him, what happens? They get taken out of the land. And the problem that I have with modern day Israel is that that is not of God that they're in that land today. Because it's not like those people that are there had this great repentance and they turn back to God and say, God, forgive us. You know, we're putting our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, because they didn't do that. Now, had they done that, then I would be saying, oh, yeah, if they're occupying that land again, maybe God probably brought them back. But that's not what happened. But that's what needs to happen in order for you know to be even considered that that's of God that they're back in there, because they're not. They're an antichrist religion. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, "If you believe Moses, you believe me." And if they don't believe Christ, that just proves they don't believe Moses. <clears throat> Anyways, we already read Romans two twenty eight. I got that in my notes here, but um, and this is why. Let's go back to John chapter four. I just wanted to point that out, but this is why the Samaritans, um, you know, and the, the woman at the well said that the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Um, it's just, it all goes back to how they viewed him. And um, Jesus then says to her in verse, um, verse 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So, this is one of the reasons why the Samaritans didn't know what they worshipped. It's because, you know, the truth was being taught in, in Judah, in Jerusalem. Like, that's where, that's kind of where the powerhouse was of, of, of God's word and the light being shined forth in general was by the prophets of the Jews. Um, because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made Israel to sin and they were worshipping all these false idols, false gods. They, they screwed up their religion of serving God. So, being of Samaria, Jesus is saying, look, you don't even know what you worship because they've been all mixed up already. They're, they're, they've, gone, um, they've gotten intermingled with the heathen. They got, they got mixed up on who God is and they worship um, idols and, and just false gods and they don't understand. But um, you know, there's also a lot of people today that are like that, that people that worship ignorantly. They don't know what they believe. They don't know what they worship. And um, I think a big reason we see that even today, even amongst Christian churches, is because they don't have the truth of God's Word. They're not using the King James Bible. They're using these perversions and these lies in these other um, versions of the Bible. And they're, if, they're, if your belief is founded in a book, and that book is a book of lies and corruption, your doctrine is going to be all messed up. You're not going to know what you're worshiping. You're going to be all screwed up with everything. And that's why we see that today. I think we could make an analogy or draw a comparison of churches today that they don't know what they worship because they don't have the truth. The, the, the Samaritans, they didn't really have the truth there. It was, it was coming of the Jews who God was using um, as his mouthpiece and they were mixed up. And um, it's the same thing we see today. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse number 23, Jesus said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must worship God with our spirit and in truth. And again, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Because the true worshipers of God, what Jesus Christ is saying right here, worship God in spirit. And in your spirit, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is bond nor free. You know, it doesn't matter. We need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We need to have the truth of God's Word, obviously. We must be born again 
for one, in order to worship in spirit. We need to have that new spirit inside of us. Otherwise, we're not really worshiping God if you're not saved. But we also need His Word, the Bible, to worship Him in truth. And we need to study His Word in order to know how we ought to worship Him. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. Man, i got to hurry up. I got so much more to go. We're like halfway through this chapter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it into high gear here. So the woman at the well, she's a woman of Samaria. She still knows that Messiah's cometh. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a Messiah. And you know, people like to tell you, oh, well, the Jews of the Old Testament, they were saved by the sacrifices and you know, these animals, there was all this other stuff. No, they weren't. They knew that the Messiah was coming. They were looking forward to the Messiah. When people got saved, it was their faith was on Jesus Christ, even if they didn't know him by name. They put their faith on God. They knew that there was a new covenant that was coming. The old covenant was, was dead away. Now, not everyone necessarily believed that or put their faith in that, but it wasn't unknown. It wasn't like this is some brand new thing that, that just caught everyone by surprise with John the Baptist and Jesus, you know, teaching and preaching these things. Even this, even this woman of Samaria knew that they were waiting for the Messiah to come and tell them all things. It was a common knowledge back even in the Old Testament that a Messiah was coming. They understood a lot of the references in the Old Testament to the Christ that was going to come. All these prophecies that they have. And that's what you know, they were looking for him. And that's why the Pharisees argued even and said that Jesus couldn't be him because you know, he's, the prophet's not going to come out of Galilee, they would say. You know, they had all these different reasons, but they were looking for it and they thought they knew the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> but she says that, you know, I know that when Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he's coming, he's going to tell us all things. And then this is where Jesus tells us, look, that's me. Jesus claims to be Christ. I've heard people say that, oh, Jesus never claimed to be the Christ. Yes, he did. Right here in this verse, he says, I that speak unto thee am he. I am the Christ. And he does it in another place too. In the book of Mark chapter 14 and verse 61, you don't have to turn there, but he says, but he held his peace and answered nothing. And this is when Jesus Christ was being questioned. You remember in the, in the gospel, this is the only one that records him saying this. And the other ones, he says, yo, thou hast said, thou sayest, thou hast said. When they're saying, yo, are you the king of the Jews? Thou sayest it. And that's typically Jesus' answer, right? But in Mark 14, verse 61, it says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, it's important to note that because there is no room for any middle ground on what you believe about Jesus Christ. He was either telling the truth and was the Christ and was God in the flesh and was that man or he was a big time deceiver and a wicked devil antichrist, you know, total deceiver. He's one or the other. He can't, there is nowhere in between to say, oh, well, he was kind of a good guy as the Muslims would like you to believe or as they like to believe. They think that, oh, well, Jesus was just a prophet, you know, just like Moses and Abraham. You know, they were all just prophets and Muhammad. No, you can't say that about Jesus Christ because if he wasn't really the Christ, if he wasn't really God in the flesh, then he's a liar. And he's lying right here when he says, I that speak unto thee am he, full well knowing what she's talking about with the Savior of the world. If he's not the Savior of the world, then he is just some liar. And we know that's not true. I, mean, I hesitate even to mention that because it's just so blasphemous to say that Jesus Christ is not the Messiah and that he's not God in the flesh and that he didn't come to save the whole world because he did and he proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt. But there is absolutely no, for, because of these statements, because of the things that he said, there is no middle ground because if he's not the Messiah, then that is extremely wicked to be claiming to be that man and to be deceiving people into thinking that, that that's you. I mean, that'd be like me going around trying to say, I'm the second coming of Jesus Christ, which I'm obviously not. So if I were to go out doing that, it would be an extremely wicked thing, try to gather people to follow me and try to teach them and all this other stuff saying, hey, I'm the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
which is what he would have been doing if he wasn't Jesus Christ. But obviously he was. He's, he is a Christ. So for the Muslims to say, oh yeah, well, we believe he's a good teacher. No, if he's not the Christ, then no, he's not. And I always bring that up um, when, I, when I go soul winning and ever I run across a Muslim that will actually talk to me. Um, he definitely claimed to be Christ. But I said I was going to kick it in at high gear. I'm slipping back into, into low gear. Let's keep reading here. So he says, um, so he tells her that. He says, like, look, I'm the Christ. Verse number 27. And upon this, and upon this, so right when he said this, came his, his disciples came, or came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? So his disciples show back up, and they see him talking to this, this Samaritan woman. And they held their, they didn't say anything, but they're thinking, like, why are you talking to this, you know, to this Samaritan? And he's giving the gospel, and it says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this, the Christ. I love that. Verse 28, the woman left her water pot there. She went to go draw water. She went because she needed water. She had that physical thirst. She left that there. She left the physical drawing of the water because, hey, she received that living water from Jesus Christ. She didn't need that water pot anymore. And what's the first thing that she does? She receives that salvation. She receives that living water. She goes and tells other people about it. Amen for that. That's the attitude that we ought to have every day. I mean, if, even if you're not brand, new, you know, brand newly saved, we ought to have that excitement and say, hey, we found the Christ. Isn't this Christ? He, sa you know, he saved me. This is what he says. He told me everything that ever I did. Isn't this the Christ? Which is what she did. She just went around and started telling everybody about it. Would to God more Christians would have this type of an attitude. Hey, isn't this the Christ? Isn't this the Christ? We found him, the Savior of the world. Put your faith on him. Leave that water. You don't need to do those works. You don't need that water that you need to keep drinking over and over again. Get the living water. Everlasting life. This is what you need. And yet today there's churches that are... that. that dissuade people who are newly saved from going out sowing. No, no, no. You got to take a class. You got to learn more. No. Get out there and tell people about Jesus. We need a lot more people doing it. You don't have to know the Bible cover to cover in order to get people saved. Hey, if you're saved, you probably know how you got saved, which is all you need to know to get someone else saved. You show them God's Word. You show them who Jesus is. Show them that Jesus died for your sins. It's not that difficult. We try to make it difficult. Now, obviously, you get better at it and learn more and be able to answer more questions. Great. Get better at it, but, but get started right away. I don't care where you're at. Just like this woman did. Verse number... Um, 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, uh, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one another, hath any man brought him out to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And this is, again, the attributes of Jesus Christ amazing. They went to go fight, buy food. We already know Jesus was weary and we know he was hungry. But he still just answers and just says, You know what? I have food. Doing God's will that is my meat. That's what's going to sustain me. Doing his work. He is dedicated to do, I mean, he was soul winning every opportunity he had. He's wearied with his journey, yet he wasn't too tired to give the gospel. Even when his disciples come back, they got food he could eat. It's more important. I've got, I've got meat. Don't worry about me. I'm doing the will of my Father that sent me. Verse number 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. <clears throat> Great promises here. When you go out soul winning, just remember your labor is never in vain. Jesus Christ said, look, the field is ripe to harvest. 
and it is today still. It was back then. There were a lot of people working. John the Baptist was out preaching and, and, and tilling that ground and trying to get people's hearts ready. And other people before him were out. The prophets were preaching God's word. And now by the time Jesus' disciples came, hey, look, the harvest is ready. We just need to reap. And that's the way it works sometimes with people, though. You got to keep this in mind. When you go out and you, and you witness and when you give the gospel, when you preach God's word unto someone, they may not be ready to be reaped at that moment. You might need to be tilling some ground. You might need to be planting some seeds. But that's why we need more workers out there so that we can have people, you know, doing some planting, doing some sowing, doing some, you know, tilling and doing some reaping. And we have the more people we have doing that, you're going to run across those same people who, hey, this person planted the seed. But this person over here now is going to come up and, and give them the gospel again. And because that seed has already been planted, now the work's going to be that much easier to the point where, hey, we're ready to harvest. Amen. Here's another, another soul saved. And that's the way it works. So don't get dis discouraged when you go out and it feels like, man, nobody's getting saved. You're doing other work. You may not be reaping on that particular day. You may just be doing some of the other work involved. But don't ever get discouraged. Don't look and, and Look, I'll be the first one to admit sometimes I'll be going out so and just going out and going out and talking to people, talking to people, and just nobody seems to be getting saved. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. And, and look where we're at already this month. You know, now we're, now we're experiencing some reaping. Amen. Praise God for that. But the wor work we were doing before is just as important because we're doing the plant and we're doing the plow, we're doing other things. And... Take rejoicing in this. The Bible says in verse 36, Jesus said, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. You're going to get real wages for the work that you do. God's going to pay you. You are building and, and earning for yourself rewards and treasures in heaven. And one of the great rewards says, You gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That person that you get saved, that person that, that puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they are going to be with us in heaven. That is life eternal. That is fruit unto life eternal. We can rejoice together. Hey, you could find this other person that says, oh man, you talked to so and so. Oh, you reaped that? Amen. You give in high fives or whatever in heaven because this person is here because this person and this person and that person all gave that person the gospel. And what a time of rejoicing that's going to be when we can get there. And, and, you know, he that sowed and he that reaped can rejoice together. And um, anyone who's won souls knows that, I mean, you, you care about the people that you, you're preaching to. You care about them. You love them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. And it's going to be an amazing thing. I can't wait. I can't wait for the souls that trusted in Christ that had anything to do with me, with, with me going out and preaching their word word to word to them, I can't wait to see them all in heaven and to meet them all and to rejoice with them. What a day that's going to be. Uh, let's wrap this up real quickly. Verse number 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So again, a lot of people, just because of that woman, they believed on Jesus Christ. Just based on her saying, just based on her witness to them, they believed on it. It says, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. So they asked him to stay, and he stayed there for two more days. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But I'm here to tell you, look, they said that they believed because of his words, and that's true. You know, they believed based on what Jesus said to him. But had that woman not gone and done what she, she had done, they still wouldn't have gotten saved. So as an indirect result of her efforts, those people also got saved. She said enough to get them to come and to hear what Jesus had to say, and then they got saved. She still led them to Christ. Even if they didn't believe her initially, they believed, which obviously you need to believe on Christ anyways, but um, she had a part in their salvation in leading them to them. Um, Verse 43, Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And amen to that. Um, <laughs> you go out preaching the gospel and start living for Christ and start doing things, 
just be ready to understand that you aren't looked the same by your family members, by people that you've maybe grown up with your old life. You know, he's saying like the people of your country, you know, and they looked at Jesus that way too. Like, isn't this, you know, the son of the carpenter? You know, they, they don't look at him the way that he ought to be as a prophet of God, as God in the flesh. You know, they just look at him, oh, well, we know this guy. I mean, we grew up around him. We know him. <coughs> And that's how your family, often, most often times, and your friends will view you because, you know, especially you get saved a little bit later, like, you know, this, I know how we used to live. I know all this stuff, you know, whatever. Or they just don't view you the same. They're just real comfortable with you. They don't look at you as a person, you know, a man of God or something like that. Um, Jesus recognized that and just be prepared to deal with that. You know, you might not always, people might not always treat you the way that, that you think is right when you go out and you're doing God's work and stuff like that. But Jesus himself said it. He said, the prophet hath no honor in his own country. So we could expect that. Let's keep reading here. We're going to finish up real fast. Then when he was come into Galilee, verse 45, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. So this guy's son is sick, and he's, he's about to die. And he's going to Jesus and saying, Look, Jesus... Come down, please, and, you know, and, and heal my son. Jesus answers and says, Look, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But this guy persists. He's just like, Look, come down. My, my, you know, my son's going to die. And Jesus answered him. He says, Go thy way, thy son liveth. So, so Jesus answered his request. He answered his prayer. He didn't even have to go down to heal him. He just says, Go ahead. And then it says, And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So this guy believed. He didn't need to see, you know, he might have needed to hear, he probably needed to hear Jesus say that, hey, look, unless you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. I'm sure that hit home with this guy. So then when Jesus said, your son lives, he's like, okay, well, I'm going to believe him. You know, because he heard already from Jesus saying, unless you, you know, see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. He, he did end up believing Jesus Christ. It says, um, and as, and I love the story with the healing. It says, and as he was, now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. So his servants are excited. He's going back home. He said, Hey, your son's alive. Then he inquire, inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. He's like, This isn't a coincidence. He knows that the reason why his son is alive is because of the exact same time that he had just spoken to Jesus said, Thy son liveth. It's amazing. And um, it says, and himself believed. Talk about adding to his belief, right? Adding to his faith, seeing, witnessing then that miracle of his son. Really, because it says he already believed. When Jesus told him that he believed, and that's probably why his son he was healed, because, because of the faith. All throughout the Bible, it's people's faith that saves them. And this man's faith, you know, got his son healed. And, um, but then it says he believed and his whole house. So a great witness, a great testimony. Um, Jesus is healing power and just telling other people about that. See, this man told him, hey, that's when Jesus told me that he was healed at the same exact moment. The whole household believed because of that. And again, this is, there's so much soul winning going on in this book and, um, and I'm excited for it. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Lord, stir up our hearts to, to be preachers of righteousness, dear Lord, to go out and to win souls. It's so important. God, stir up our, our hearts and our minds and just continue to teach us out of your word. Continue to build this church, dear Lord. Help us to, to gather together um, with like-minded believers, people who want to serve you, people who want to do your work, dear God, people who love to hear the truth. I pray that you would please instruct us in wisdom and in knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.